Hi, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 17. In this lecture, we'll discuss normal force and friction. These topics are covered in Chapter 5 of our textbook by Sir Wei Anjouet. In our previous lecture, we learned about the force of weight and also tension. In this lecture, we want to discuss contact forces. Physical contact between the atoms of two objects gives rise to electrostatic repulsion. The contact force is the net repulsion of many atoms. So in this picture, we have a box sitting on top of a table. If we were to zoom in on the interface between the box and the table, we would see many, many atoms that are interacting with each other. The interaction between two atoms is a complicated interaction that we will not study in this class. For now, we'll just say that each atom has a cloud of electrons and the cloud of electrons of one atom repels or pushes away the cloud of electrons from another atom. So this force is referred to as an electrostatic repulsion. Of course, there are many, many atoms. If you have a box sitting on a table, you're going to have more than trillions and trillions of atoms from the box and trillions and trillions of atoms from the table, each repelling each other. The net or the total of all of those repulsions is referred to as the contact force. If we wanted to really understand and calculate the contact force, we would have to zoom in on the individual atoms or molecules of the box and the table and see how they are interacting with each other. These interactions end up being very complicated in part because there are many, many atoms involved, but also in part because those atoms are not arranged along a perfectly flat surface. Although the surface of a table might be smooth and flat to the touch, your touch is not really sensitive to uh, microscopic or nanometer variations in the height of the atoms. Although your hand is not sensitive to nanometer variations in height, individual atoms are sensitive to that. And so the forces that these atoms on the bottom are exerting on the forces on the atoms of the top could be quite complicated. They could be pointing to the left, could be pointing to the right, upwards or even downwards. So the details here is extremely complicated and difficult to model. To simplify the situation, we're going to take the contact force and divide it up into two simpler forces. We'll call those forces friction and the normal force. Frictional and normal forces are effective forces. They both refer to really the same force, the electrostatic interactions that we were just discussing. However, they represent different aspects or components of that force. By speaking about frictional and normal forces, we're essentially simplifying a very complicated situation. Our approach will be as follows. If a box is sitting on top of a table, the electrostatic interactions between all those atoms is going to result in a force, which we're calling the contact force, and that force might be pointing upwards and to the right. In this particular example, under different circumstances, the force might be pointing to the left. Whichever way it's pointing, it will have an X component and it will have a Y component. We'll refer to the X component as friction and we'll refer to the Y component as the normal force. A little more precisely, we'll refer to the component that is parallel to the surface as friction and the component that is perpendicular to the surface as the normal force. In fact, mathematicians often use the word normal as a synonym for perpendicular or orthogonal. So any force that ends up being uh, perpendicular or forming a 90 degree angle with the surface can be thought of as a normal force. In this context, friction and the normal force are simply the parallel and perpendicular components of the contact force. We'll have to discuss the normal force and friction separately and in great detail. Let's discuss the normal force first. The direction of the normal force is always perpendicular to the contact surface. 
like any other force, the normal force has a direction, an orientation, and a magnitude. Its direction will always be perpendicular to the contact surface. If the contact surface is a nice horizontal table, then the normal force will point in the vertical direction. But we will encounter cases where the table might be tilted, in which case the normal force will not necessarily be vertical, but it will always be perpendicular to the surface that the object is contacting. Its direction will always be such that it opposes other perpendicular forces. We say that the normal force is a reactive force, meaning that there isn't an equation that you can plug numbers into. You'll first have to figure out what other perpendicular forces are doing, such as weight and tension. Once you know what those forces are doing, then you can calculate the normal force. The normal force also has a magnitude. Its magnitude, by virtue of being a reactive force, depends on other perpendicular forces. Its magnitude is always sufficient to cancel other perpendicular forces. So if there is, let's just say, 20 newtons of weight pulling the object down, then the normal force might be 20 newtons pushing the object up. It will be sufficient to cancel other perpendicular forces. Of course, the normal force can't just grow uh, infinitely big. There is a maximum value for this particular force. We call it n max. And the actual value of n max really depends on the strength of the surface. If you're placing a box on a glass table versus a steel table versus a wooden table, you'll have different values for n max. So n max for a solid steel table in general is going to be a lot larger than the n max for a very delicate, fragile glass table, for example. When other perpendicular forces exceed n max, that is when the normal force can no longer balance those other forces, uh, disaster ensues. Basically, the surface breaks and the object falls through. In our course, we will not be considering this case. In our course, we will always consider uh, relatively simple situations where we're not breaking through the surface. Here's a practice problem involving the normal force. A block of weight 100 newtons is at rest on a horizontal surface. Calculate the normal force on the block in each of the following cases. So we have four scenarios depicted here, and we want to calculate what the normal force is in each scenario. We'll start with the leftmost scenario. That's the simplest one. The block has a weight of 100 newtons that tells us that the force of gravity pulling this block downwards is 100 newtons. In fact, we could represent that force by drawing an arrow on the block pointing downwards, and we can label this arrow as W, indicating that this represents weight. We can, be even, uh, we can be even a little more precise and write this W as 0, comma, minus 100 newtons, indicating that weight does not operate in the horizontal direction. And in the vertical direction, there's 100 newtons of force uh, pointing in the negative Y direction. Now, we're actually interested in the normal force. We can see that the block is in contact with a horizontal surface. The atoms are repelling each other. So there must be another force, a normal force. And in this case, the normal force is going to point straight up. It's going to point straight up because the normal force is reactive. It's trying to cancel the force of weight. If the normal force is to cancel the force of weight, then its components must be 0, 100. In this case, you can see that when we add n to w, we'll get 0, 0. A force of 0, a net force of 0, means no acceleration. So the block will remain where it is, sitting on the table or sitting on the floor without motion. Now, in this case, we're really interested in the magnitude of the normal force. So we can say that for this case on the left side, n is simply equal to 100 newtons. 
Notice here I'm talking about the magnitude of the normal force. I did not draw an arrow over the N, and I've not given it any subscripts. If you wanted to, you could say something like N sub X is equal to zero. You can also say N sub Y is equal to minus 100 Newtons. You should know how the magnitude is related to the components. Remember to calculate the magnitude of the vector. You square the X component, you square the Y component, you add those together and you take the square root. The end result is the magnitude, which is going to be 100 Newtons. Let's now consider this second scenario. We have the same box sitting on the same floor, but now there is a new force. There is a person pushing down on the box. So imagine just putting your finger on the box and just pushing it down with a force of 200 Newtons. Now the situation has gone a little more complicated. We still have weight pulling the object down like so. We can say that um, we can represent this arrow as such, zero comma minus 100, just like before, it is the same box, its weight has not changed. But now we have an additional force that is also pushing the box down. We can kind of represent this like this. And we can refer to this as the force of the person or the finger or something like that. And this force would be zero comma minus 20 because the person is pushing in the negative y direction. Now the box is in contact with the floor. So there is a normal force. The normal force is reactive. It will try to cancel these other two forces. To do that, it will push up like so. And in order to balance these other forces, its components will have to be zero comma 120. If you now add these three forces, you'll get a net force of zero. Or you'll see that the upward force of 120 will balance the downward force of 120 newtons. So in this particular case, we can now say that the magnitude of the normal force is 120 newtons. Its direction would be up. In the third scenario, we again have a person pushing on the box, but the person is not pushing in the vertical direction. The person is pushing in the horizontal direction. Remember that the normal force only acts in the perpendicular direction. The normal force cannot act horizontally in this example. It only acts vertically. So now we're going to have to say that there is weight and weight is as before, pulling the object down, its components are going to be zero minus 100. And we can also say that there is a, another force here. This is the force of the person or the finger. And this time this force would be 20 comma zero, 20 Newtons in the positive X direction and zero in the Y direction. The normal force is reactive, but it reacts only to other perpendicular forces. The normal force simply doesn't care or is not able to react to horizontal forces. For that, we'll have to talk about friction next. So in this scenario, the normal force reacts only to weight. To balance weight, the normal force will have to point upwards. and its components will have to be zero comma 100. If I ask you what's the magnitude of this vector, you would simply say its magnitude is 100 Newtons. In the fourth scenario, we have two people exerting forces on the box. So there's still the weight, but one person is pushing to the right with a force of 40 Newtons, and another person is pushing downwards with a force of 20 Newtons. Weight is still there pulling the box down. The normal force will react to weight. It will also react to this top finger, but it will not react to the left finger. The end result is that the magnitude of the normal force will be 120 Newtons. You can see that it's adequate to cancel the weight of the block. It's also adequate to cancel these 20 Newtons here, but it does not respond in any way to the 40 newtons that's being applied horizontally.
the normal force is one aspect or one component of the contact force. The other component of the contact force is friction. Friction is a rather complicated force in part because there are actually three types of friction. There is static friction, kinetic friction, and rolling friction. Static friction is the type of friction that acts on objects at rest. So when you know an object is not moving, its velocity is zero, then you can say that there is static friction acting on it. When an object is in motion, then we say there is kinetic friction is acting on it, so a slightly different type of a friction. And then sometimes objects are in motion, but it's rolling motion as opposed to linear motion. In that case, we have rolling friction acting on the object. In this particular class, we'll focus our attention on static friction and kinetic friction. Ultimately, you'll see that all types of friction are similar in some essential ways. So if you understand static friction and kinetic friction, later you'll be able to figure out rolling friction on your own. Let's begin our study of friction with static friction, and we'll turn to kinetic friction afterward. Static friction is a vector, like all forces, and therefore it has a magnitude and a direction. The direction of static friction is always parallel to the contact surface, and it opposes other parallel forces. Notice static friction is a reactive force, and it's very similar to the normal force, which we were just discussing. The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. Static friction is always parallel. The normal force opposes other perpendicular forces. Static friction opposes other parallel forces. The magnitude of static friction depends on what other parallel forces are doing. If a box is being dragged across the surface because a rope is attached to it and tension is being applied, we would first have to figure out what the force of tension is. We would have to first figure out what other parallel forces are. Based on that information, we could then calculate static friction. The magnitude of static friction is always sufficient to cancel other parallel forces. So static friction will always resist what other parallel forces are trying to do to the object. Of course, static friction can't just grow infinitely big. It does have a maximum value. That maximum value is denoted as F max, and it depends on the properties of the surfaces that are in contact. We can say that F max actually depends on the roughness of the surface. In general, if surfaces are very smooth, then the maximum value of friction is going to be very low, indicating that there's very little friction between smooth surfaces. If we have very rough surfaces, then there's going to be lots of friction between them. The value of F max is going to be quite large. I'll show you a formula for F max in just a minute. But for now, let me just say that when other parallel forces exceed F max, the object begins to slip. So note that we're talking about static friction. So we are talking about an object that is at rest. Those parallel forces that are acting on the object are going to be opposed and canceled by static friction. But when static friction can't keep up, when those other parallel forces exceed F max, then the object begins to move at that point, static friction disappears and kinetic friction takes its place. Before talking about kinetic friction, let me give you a formula for calculating the maximum value of static friction. Although the formula for calculating the maximum value of normal friction is not a simple one, the formula for F max is relatively simple. To calculate the maximum possible value of static friction, we will take the normal force, which we've been discussing, and multiply it by mu sub s. So Greek letter mu here stands for the coefficient of friction. We will soon discover that there are two kinds of coefficients of friction. There's mu sub s and mu sub k, so coefficient of static friction and coefficient of kinetic friction. Uh, mu sub s is basically a number that characterizes the roughness of the surface. 
So mu for very smooth surfaces like ice and glass is going to be a very small number, close to zero. Whereas for very rough surfaces like concrete or asphalt, it's going to be a relatively large number. The point is that depending on the material and the smoothness of the surface, you will have some coefficient of static friction. And if you multiply that by the normal force, you can find the maximum value of the force of friction. If other parallel forces exceed this particular value, then the object slips, it begins to move, it begins to slide across the surface. In that case, static friction disappears and kinetic friction takes its place. So now we need to discuss kinetic friction. When an object is in motion, uh, sliding across a surface, for example, the force of friction that's acting on it is kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is always parallel to the contact surface. In that respect, it's just like static friction. And it opposes the object's velocity. So here's a subtle distinction. Whereas static friction opposes other parallel forces, kinetic friction is relatively simple. It opposes the object's velocity. So figure out which way the object is sliding, figure out which way the velocity vector points, and the kinetic friction vector will point in the opposite direction. It is a vector. So we need to know its magnitude, and its magnitude quite simply is given by this formula. Notice that kinetic friction is not a reactive force. While static friction reacts to other parallel forces, kinetic friction is relatively simple to deal with. To figure out the magnitude of kinetic friction, which we'll denote as F sub K, we will need the coefficient of kinetic friction. So this is Greek letter mu and mu sub k tells us something about the roughness of the surface. If we multiply that by the normal force, then we find the magnitude of kinetic friction. To summarize our discussion of friction so far, remember that there are two kinds of friction that we're interested in, static friction and kinetic friction. Static friction opposes other parallel forces and therefore is a reactive force. And in general, friction depends on two factors. It depends on the roughness of the two surfaces in contact. That's characterized by mu, the coefficient of friction. And friction also depends on the normal force that's acting on the objects. Remember that the normal force itself is a reactive force and it's reacting to the perpendicular forces. This connection between friction and the normal force shouldn't be surprising because after all, friction and the normal force are really different components of the same force, namely the contact force. However, in practice, whenever you're trying to calculate the force of friction, you almost always calculate the normal force, force first, and then you calculate friction. Calculating the force of friction often requires that you know the coefficient of friction. Here are some representative values. If you're discussing, for example, the motion of rubber tires on a concrete surface, like a concrete road, then you will need to know that the coefficient of static friction is 1.0 and that for kinetic friction is 0.8. If you want to talk about, for example, a wooden block sliding on a wooden tabletop, then the coefficient of static friction is 0.4 and the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.2. You don't need to memorize these values. These values are almost always given to you, but given these values, you should know how to calculate static friction and kinetic friction in each case. Here's a practice problem involving friction. A large wooden crate with a mass of 100 kilograms sits on a concrete floor. The coefficients of friction for wood on concrete are 0.5 for static friction and 0.3 for kinetic friction. Part A asks, what is the force of friction when the crate is simply at rest on the floor? So to answer questions of this nature, you want to analyze some of the other forces that are acting on the crate first. In particular, you want to calculate the normal first, usually. 
So a good starting point is to say that, well, we have a crate and this is presumably on planet Earth. I'm going to represent the crate using a dot. I'm going to draw a downward arrow representing the force of friction. The magnitude of this arrow is going to be mg. This is the weight of the crate. m is given to me as 100, g is 9.8. So in principle, I could figure out weight. And of course, the normal force is going to react to this weight. So the normal force is going to be pointing upwards. And uh, if it is to balance the downward force of weight, its magnitude needs to be uh, mg as well. I could be a little more precise and write things in terms of components. I could say w is equal to zero in the x direction and then minus 980 in the y direction. So that's 100 times 9.8. And I can also write n in terms of its components and I would say that's equal to zero comma uh, plus 980. And now I can see that the normal force and weight balance each other out. They cancel each other out. That's what the normal force does. It reacts to other perpendicular forces. Now it turns out most of this is actually not relevant to the force of friction. The question is asking about friction. Friction is all about the horizontal forces. At this point, there are no horizontal forces acting on the, on the wooden crate. The box or the crate is simply sitting there. As you can see, all the forces that are acting on it are in the vertical direction or in the perpendicular direction. And so we can say that since there are no parallel forces, static friction is zero. Remember, static friction reacts to other parallel forces. If the sum of other parallel forces is zero, then the static friction is also zero. In a sense, it has nothing to react to. So we can say that the force of static friction is zero in this case. Here's a continuation of the same problem. Again, we have a wooden crate sitting on the floor with the same coefficients of friction as before. This time, a person is actually pushing the box. So what is the force of friction when a worker pushes the crate with a force of 200 newtons? Notice the situation has changed slightly. We have um, weight still pulling the object down. We can represent that using an arrow that points downwards. We can calculate the magnitude of this. It's going to be mass times the gravitational acceleration, mg. In reaction to weight, there's going to be an upward force. That's the normal force that pushes the block up. And then, of course, the person is pushing on the, on the crate. And so now there is a force pointing to the right. And we can call this force of the person or, let's say, the worker. We need to calculate magnitudes and maybe components of these vectors. Um, we can calculate the magnitude of the normal force relatively easily. The normal force reacts to other perpendicular forces. So the normal force is reacting to weight. Weight has a magnitude of mg, which is 980 newtons. So the normal force is going to have a magnitude of 980 newtons. From this, we can calculate the maximum value of friction. Remember that F max is mu s times n. So uh, mu s is 0.5. We're going to multiply that by 980 newtons, and we'll find that the maximum value of friction is 490 newtons. This does not mean that the force of friction is 490 newtons. This only tells us that the force of friction could be anything from zero up to 490 newtons. Notice that in this particular case, the force of the worker is less than F max, and therefore the crate does not move. So the person is pushing on the box, but he's not pushing very hard. The force that he's applying is not adequate to overcome friction. If he wants to move the box, he needs to exert more than 490 newtons of force. So in this particular scenario, the crate simply remains at rest and we are justified in talking about the force of static friction. Therefore, the force of static friction is going to be simply 200 newtons. Remember, static friction is reactive. 
it reacts to other parallel forces. Looking at our picture here, the only parallel force is the force of the worker, 200 newtons to the right. So the force of friction is going, be, is going to be 200 newtons to the left. So we can draw another force here and call it static friction. And this force will simply oppose this force. The static friction will oppose the force of the worker. And so static friction will be 200 newtons. If you want, you can write down the components of static friction. Just to be a little more precise, you can express static friction as minus 200 comma zero. But here in my calculations, I'm indicating only the magnitudes of these forces. The directions are implied by my force diagram in this picture. Here's another continuation of the same problem. This is part C. Again, we have the same wooden crate sitting on the same floor. This time, the worker is pushing a little bit harder. What is the force of friction when a worker pushes the crate with a force of 500 newtons? Well, the weight of the crate does not change because the mass of the crate does not change. Uh, the normal force does not change either. It's still 980 newtons. F max is still 490 newtons. We calculate this, calculated this on the previous slide as well. This simply tells us that the force of friction could be anywhere from zero all the way up to 490 newtons, but it cannot be higher than that. In this particular case, we notice that the force of the worker is actually greater than F max. This fact implies that the crate moves. So initially, the worker was pushing with only 200 newtons. He noticed the crate was not moving, so he pushed a little bit harder and harder and harder. Every time he increased his pushing force, static friction opposed him and resisted the motion of the crate. But once his force exceeds 490 newtons, then static friction basically disappears. The crate begins to slip. It begins to slide across the surface. And therefore, we should be talking about kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is easy to calculate. Its magnitude is mu times n. n is 980. Mu is 0 0.4. Multiplying those together, we find that the magnitude of the force of friction is 490 newtons. Or, sorry, 294 newtons. If you want, you can be a little more precise and write kinetic friction as a vector in which case you would say its x component is minus 294 newtons and its y component is zero. It might be interesting to track the evolution of friction in a problem like this. This graph essentially shows how the force of friction changes as a function of time. So we can imagine that at t equals zero, the person was not applying any kind of a force to the crate, and therefore the force of friction was zero. Then at some point, uh, the person puts his hand on the crate and begins to push harder and harder and harder on the crate, trying to get it to move. And as the person, as the person pushes harder, the force of friction also increases, opposing him step for step. But at some point in time, the person is pushing hard enough to get the object to move. So in this graph at let's say t equals four seconds, the force of the person has reached F max, that would be 490 newtons in, that, in this case. And at that moment in time, static friction simply disappears and kinetic friction takes over. Notice kinetic friction is not a reactive force. So its value remains constant while the person is pushing the crate, right? Static friction is increasing because it is a reactive force, but kinetic friction remains constant. The value of kinetic friction is always calculated using the same formula. F sub k is equal to mu sub k times n. This practice problem involves both the normal force and the force of friction. A block of weight 100 newtons is at rest on a horizontal surface with a coefficient of static friction of 0.4. Calculate the normal and friction forces on the block in each of the following cases. 
So we've done a practice problem like this already. In that case, we were just talking about the normal force. Here, we want to talk about uh, the force of friction as well. We'll start with the left scenario where the box is just simply sitting on the crate. In this case, weight or gravity is pulling the block down. The normal force will react and it will push the block up. So the magnitude of normal force will be 100 newtons. There are no horizontal forces. There are no forces that are parallel to the surface. Therefore, friction has nothing to react to. So in this case, we would say the force of static friction is simply zero newtons. In this second scenario, weight is pulling the block down. The finger is also pushing the block down. So there is a net force of 120 newtons pushing the block down. The normal force reacts to all of that, and therefore we can say the magnitude of the normal force is 120 newtons, and it um, points upwards so that it can cancel weight and the force of the finger. Once again, there are no parallel forces in the horizontal direction or in the x direction, and so the static force of friction is going to be zero newtons. The situation changes in this third scenario a little bit. The normal force only cares about perpendicular forces. Weight is the only perpendicular or vertical force, so the normal force is going to react to weight and its magnitude is going to be 100 newtons, its direction is going to be pointing upwards. There is, however, a parallel force. The finger is pushing in the parallel direction, as in parallel to the surface, with a force of 20 newtons, and static friction will simply react to that with a magnitude of 20 newtons. If the finger is pushing to the right, friction will oppose it and it will push to the left. In this last scenario, we have a normal force of 120 newtons because weight is pulling it down. The finger is also pushing down. Weight is only, uh, sorry, the normal force is only reacting to the perpendicular forces. So the normal force reacts to this finger force and weight. So its reaction will be 120 newtons pointing upwards. And the force of friction is going to be 40 newtons in this case. The only horizontal or parallel force is the force of the finger, this finger on the left, and that's the only thing that friction is pointing or uh, responding or reacting to, and so the force of friction will be 40 newtons pointing to the left. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.